Brian G. Bellinger has been the chef and owner of Workman's Cafe on James Allen since 2001. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with her about what's new and what's now at the cafe for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Chef Angie Bellinger, welcome to the award-winning Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, Chef. For, um, thank you, Mr. Washington, for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I know that you are the chef and owner of Worksman's uh, Cafe right there on James Island, and I bypass it all the time when I'm going to Publix, <laughs> and I need to come there to eat, actually. But Workman's Cafe is a Charleston, South Carolina area, soul food restaurant, serving seven meats and delicious sides prepared from a family-oriented recipes. Let me ask you this. Who is Chef Angie Bellinger these days? Uh, man, I... The best way I can describe myself is that I'm very hardworking. I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, I never dreamed that um, I would be doing this today. I love to cook, but Workman's Cafe was my mom's idea. So today, uh, comparing today to when we started in 01, I would say I've evolved into a, I wouldn't even say an activist. I'm not an activist. I'm just a community helper. Yes, indeed. And I, I was doing my research over the weekend about you. Obviously, you know, your mom wanted you to come back from Ohio where you were. And, you know, at the time you had a little resistance about that. But let me ask you, what were you dreaming to do before coming back to Charleston and actually now running the restaurant? Well, when my mom sent me that, oh, I'm sorry, when she made that call, um, I was in the process of buying a home. I was going, I, my intents were to make Ohio my place of residence because I loved where I lived. I love Middletown, Ohio, which is in between Cincinnati and Dayton, hence the name Middletown. Mm -hmm. I loved the area. I was looking at buying a home. I was working with a realtor. and. Um, but fortunately for me, before I plunked down any fees or deposits, that's when my mom called. It took me about, I would say about six weeks to make that decision. And it took me about three months to actually make the move. Wow. Yeah, I was not interested in coming back. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Miss Angie. What part of Middletown, Ohio, resembles part of James Island where you grew up? None. <laughs> None. Uh, Middletown is a, I don't know if they're still open, but Middletown was at that time known as a steel mill, com uh, com steel mill town. Uh, AK Steel was the largest employer there. And um, in the next town over a few miles down the road, I think there was international paper uh, but um i don't know it was an industrial type town but it was the friends that i made at church and um, you know just made me feel like if i didn't live in charleston then middletown would be the next best option for me because i don't i don't like big cities hmm. yeah hmm. Hmm. And, and, and let me go back to when you moved from ohio back here to home with charleston what were you doing in that process during that time? What were you thinking? Did I make the right decision? <laughs> because, well, I'm, the other thing is about Middletown, that I moved to that area because I love the winter. I love the fact that they have a change in season. So it snowed often, and I love cold weather. Even though I was born in August, but I love cold. The colder, the better. But after I made the decision to move and actually moving, um, I'd gotten to, I did ask myself, did I make the right decision? And then somewhere along that, in that time frame, I decided, well, you know, it's no turning back. Um, being the youngest of eight, I didn't know my mom missed me that much, but, um, I'd already given her my word. And, uh, of course she'd made quite a few phone calls between that time asking, when are you coming home? What's taking you so long? So, um. Yeah, I was in it after I made that decision. I couldn't uh, couldn't turn back. Turn back. And what were your mom doing 
in, 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 in that time that you were processing, well, trying to get from Ohio back home? She was making sure I had everything I needed. Uh, when it got close to actually coming back, because I told her I didn't want to come back until the new year. I think it ended up being January 4th. Somewhere between January 4th and 6th that I actually traveled back. And um, when we got to, during the holidays of that year, it was 2000, the year 2000, um, she called me, she asked me, what's taking you so long? What do you need? What do you need from me? What do you need me to do? I, I told her, I said, well, I'm trying, because I was living in a two-bedroom house. I said, I'm trying to pack up the house. I'm trying to sell. What do you need to sell? Just leave it. Just leave everything. Come home. And so in that process, I was shipping my things. I boxed a lot of things. And I think I shipped somewhere between 12 and 15 boxes home. Mm -hmm. And after all of my boxes came, then the, the phone calls continued. I mean, it escalated. You need to just leave. What do you have left? Just leave it. Just leave it. You shipped everything you, needed, you need when you get here, right? Yes, ma'am. Well, what do you need? Angie, can you just, is your car broken? Do I need to have your car? No, the car is fine. Are you going to miss car? Are you going to make? Yes, the car is fine. So um, when I made that call, I think it was um, the night before I left, after I packed everything up, I called her and I said, okay, I'll be heading out in the morning. I spent the night at a friend's house because I had already turned in my keys to my house and gotten back my deposits. So I said, I'm, I'm going to spend the night at a friend's house. And then I'll be heading out about three o'clock in the morning. And, um, yeah, from what I was told by some of my, my family members and some of her church members, because my mom was a pastor, uh, from what I was told from their mem from her members, when you called, I have never seen your mom more excited than when you called and said you're heading out at three o'clock in the morning. Because she kept saying, my baby's coming home. I go, oh, wow, man, okay. Okay. But, yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, when I was doing my research, I didn't notice, you know, like I said, I always go, I'm, I'm, I always look at your place when I'm walking out of Publix, but I didn't know that your mom actually had a bookstore and I think a church right next to the restaurant. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. The bookstore was attached she had the bookstore first, the Bible bookstore, and then she added on the part for the restaurant, and the church is across the yard. So she started the ministry first, and um, then my mom was always, man, I love Clinton. That woman had, had always been an entrepreneur. She always had her hands in. She always believed in, you know, I can make money, I can do this, and so I guess she deposited that bug inside of me. Mm. But yeah, she, um, but being, I guess being a mother, a single mother of eight children starting in the sixties, she did what she had to do to, um, you know, and everything was above board legal, but, um, she did what she had to do to feed her children and to keep a roof. And she always said that, you know, I did what I had to do to keep a roof over my children's head and keep them fed. So, um, she started the ministry in 1970. I think three or four. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, okay. What was uh, that part of Jane? Obviously, it's Grimble Road. But uh, what was Grimble Road like before she came and, you know, obviously opened up all of these businesses? Uh, when we moved over here in 75, um, where Publix is now, there was a family that had. They raised pigs and cows, and um, on where Food Line and uh, Ghost Gym is now, right. it was a tomato field. And um, what else was here? There was a whole lot. The first store in this area at that time was is the store that's on the corner, the gas station that's on the corner of Folly and Grimble. Right. And the opposite corners, of course, you know, the cemetery. And uh, there was nothing on the other corner. It was just all, you know, wooded areas. But, um, and it was a bunch of children. I, I put it, yeah. Yeah, there was a, bu a bunch of kids, a bunch of us riding in the road with our bikes. And so, yeah, it wasn't fully grown. It definitely wasn't nearly as busy as it is now. 
And you can't ride your bike in the middle of the rat road anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time trying to get across the street there. But <laughs> absolutely. absolutely, yes, sir. And you talk about obviously you being the youngest of eight kids. What was it like to, growing up in the kitchen with your mom at that time? Well, I didn't enter into the kitchen with my mom until I was fourteen. And uh, by that time, all of my brothers and sisters were married and gone, raising their own families. So one day, I don't know, out of the blue one day, I, I think I, I know why I asked her this. I asked her if she would teach me how to cook. And um, believe it or not, my dad taught her how to cook. Yeah, because when they got married, she was 16 and he was 22. So. Um, and then her mom died when she was, I think, 14, I think. I think. Yeah, I think her mom died when she was 14. So and she didn't want to learn how to cook because she was too busy out there in the fields playing with her, her brothers. So my dad taught her how to cook. And then one day I asked her if she would teach me. And then she said to me, well, okay, uh, when I'm in this kitchen, I expect you to be here. And you're going to do everything I tell you to do. No back talk. Yes, ma'am. And so. We evolved like that. And I think the main reason why I asked her to teach me how to cook because I love to eat. And I want to be able to prepare my food when I want it and not have to wait until she comes home from work. So, um, yeah, I, I, she taught me how to cook. And when I got more comfortable in the kitchen, then I made sure I got home from school before she got home from work. Okay. So I made sure she had a meal when she got home. Yeah. Wow. I can think of a whole lot of things that I grew up eating, eggs and rice, this and that. Yeah, yes. What are those things that you grew up cooking in the kitchen as a kid that you still eat today? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, potatoes. I, I would have to say potatoes. Uh, one version that we grew up eating and I haven't had in years we used to, we didn't buy frozen potatoes. We made our own French fries. And we fried it in the skillet and the cast iron, just like we fried the chicken. And, um, but today, I would say fried chicken because my mom taught me how to make the best fried chicken. So I, I'd have to say, other than potatoes, I'd have to say fried chicken. Wow. Yeah. And you said in workman's uh, uh, works. Okay, what is that other food item that describes you as a chef? Oh my god, the meatloaf. The meatloaf. Um, and I chose the meatloaf because I hate meatloaf. I really do not like meatloaf. I love burgers, but I don't like meatloaf. Mm. But my meatloaf is my third highest selling meat behind the pork chop and the fried chicken. And my customers, when they found out that I don't like meatloaf, quite a few, uh, quite a few of them say, you know, for somebody who doesn't like meatloaf, you make a darn good meatloaf. And um, I said, well, because I try not to allow my personal feelings to interfere with how I prepare my food. Mm. I don't like pork chops, but pork chop is my number one selling meat. So, you know, meatloaf, yeah, I, I have to say for somebody, and I just, I don't like the consistency of it. Mm. So I have to say, yeah, the meatloaf, you're for somebody who doesn't like it, man, in the words of my customers, I do a darn good job at it. I heard about that. I heard about that. You say that, quote, workman's is not very easy on the eyes, but once you get in and take, you take a bite, the atmosphere, it just makes you feel at home. I know that you do a lot of photography, and I think you still sell photography photographs in your shop, in your restaurant, that is. What is your snapshot of Worksman Cafe right now? Well, we recently underwent renovations in, was it, has it been a year? It's been a year. Wow. Yeah, we underwent renovations in around the holidays. It started in the end of September of 2020. And it wrapped up in January of 2021. 
my most favorite snapshot that I took, um, the entrance, yes. you know, from the register point of view. And um, I posted it on my page and the cafe's page. And the entrance, seeing where workmen came from. Mm. And um, when I made that statement about the atmosphere, we were in need of a great deal of repairs. And uh, some, of co- some of the customers have left reviews online saying that the, the ambiance, the atmosphere leaves a lot to be desired. But once you taste the food, you forget about all of that. And uh, one lady said, after all, you're not going there for the, for the ambiance or the atmosphere. You're going there for the food. But um, th- that shot of the entrance from the register uh, point of view, I think that is my favorite shot. Uh, it, to me, it just sa- it says you've, that we've arrived. It says welcome. Yes. And, um, I just, I, I don't know. I just, I love it. I love it. Well, speaking of welcoming, Miss Angie, what is the state of customer service? At Workman's or, or in, in general? general? General, yes, ma'am. T- today, when I, when I go out to shop, uh, be it retail or uh, food and beverage or wherever, I, l- I really pay attention to customer service because Apparently you did something, something was said and or done to get them in the door. But customer service is what's going to keep them coming back. And so I really pride myself on customer service. I have experienced a lot of bad customer service. Uh, Today there is no thank you. There is no more please. There is no more you're welcome. Um, It's like they're doing you a favor by being there. And when my customer customers come into Workman's, I want them, I don't care what kind of a day I have. And everybody will tell you, I put in 12 to 15 hours a day working. And this business, as anyone else can tell you, it will zap you. But I really try not to let that reflect when the customer comes in. Unless it's a regular customer, then they understand. But today's customer service to me, it seems to be lacking a lot of mannerism. And um, one thing I have learned is that is not something you can teach on the job. That is something that has to be learned in the home. And uh, if you don't come from a, a base where you're taught to say, please, thank you, and you're welcome, that's not going to reflect on the job because I, actually you're only there because for whatever reason, other than, I mean, because you just got bills to pay, you know. So. Yeah. And what keeps your customers coming back to Worksmith Cafe? Well, if you talk to my regulars, some of them will say, well, it's sure the personality of the chef. But <laughs> when they will, those regulars, they will say, well, it's the food. But um, on the most, for the most part, I've, I've read comments, you know, people laughed on Google, TripAdvisor, um, Yelp, on the cafe's page. They say that Miss Angie is such a nice person. Uh, she makes you feel comfortable in her presence. My family members will say, yeah, they don't know you like we know you. I say, well, you're not my customers. <laughs> I know you guys, I so, but they will say it's the, the welcome feel that they get when they walk through the door. and um, But most of them will probably say the food. Speaking of which, I, I wanted to go back to what you said earlier about meatloaf and pork chops. Like you say, hey, I, I hate it completely. What are those other foods that you hate eating that you actually have to cook for the restaurant? Collard greens. Oh, oh yes, Quentin. Yes. Oh, my God. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, I get that same reaction from a lot of people. I do not like collards. And it's because my mom loved them so much. We had, I think we had collard greens every Sunday except one Sunday out of the month. Mm. She loved collard. I, I ate it so much. And my customers love it. One lady, she travels from Mount Pleasant about once a month 
to get our collard greens. I don't like them. But my customers love them. But I don't care. I said as long as they like it, that's all that matters. Exactly right. And you said this too. Uh, obviously, you have been serving comfort food since 2001. What is the biggest difference from 2001 to 2022 when you think of comfort food? It seems now um, that word, that term, or those words are being applied to a wider range of foods. It seems now it's no longer about the foods that you grew up eating. Uh, in my opinion, comfort foods will always be that food, that meal you ate at grandma's table. That will always be, because any of us who grew up eating at grandma's table, grandma didn't sit you down to a sandwich. She didn't sit you down. Once in a blue moon, you would get milk and cookies. All right? Once in a blue moon, you might get a hamburger or hot dog from grandma's house. But grandma believed in food. You need comfort. You need something to soothe your spirit. And so, my, in my opinion, that to me is comfort food. What you grew up eating at grandma's table. Um, it is, it, I don't know, I don't know why the range has been expanded. Mm. But um, folks are looking at comfort food in another, I don't know, I just, I don't know, Prince. I just don't see, um, I don't know. I don't want to step on any toes, so <laughs> that's my that's my opinion of comfort food. Yes, and how has comfort food changed your spirit? And you know what? I'm glad you asked that because before we opened Workman's Cafe, I when I moved away from home in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1993, and. Um, no, I'm sorry, 1989, when I left home, that was the first time I ever lived on my own. And I vowed that there were three things I would never cook in my apartment. Lima beans, rice, and fried chicken. Never. I went away to college in 89. I went to graduate school in 93. And I said, I will never, and those items never were cooked in my, any of my apartments. And when we opened Workman's Cafe, my mom says, if you don't have anything else on the menu, you've got to have lima beans, white rice, and fried chicken. So I had the fried chicken down pat. I had the white rice down pat. But she had to work with me um, on the lima beans. There were days my lima beans were too watery, and there were days they were too thick. So she volunteered to cook my beans for me. I think she did it two weeks in a row. And then she turned me loose. And um, when she tried my first pot after that, she said, I never thought I'd say this, but the student is better than the teacher. And... Um, yeah, but for about 10 years, I never ate lima beans. I never ate fried chicken. Never ate white rice. As long as I lived away from home. Wow. So that has changed. And now I've gotten so good at the lima beans. Um, I see some people at least three times a week. They'll come in just to get beans and rice. Mm. So, um, yeah. I said, okay. Do you personally eat lima beans to this day? I stopped about two years ago, but when I learned how to, when I mastered it, in my opinion, when I mastered it, I used to eat lima beans and rice every day until I got tired of it. Yeah. About two years ago, I stopped. But now I will occasionally, yeah, occasionally, because I don't have a customer that comes in and they'll dine in and when they're done, oh my God, I'm saying, these beans, these beans were the best. I'm like, don't do that. What? What do you mean? Don't no, now you're gonna make me eat beans. So uh, yeah, every now and then I'll I have a bowl of beans and rice. Yeah. Yeah, I had that a couple we had it a couple of weeks ago at the house, so that was really good. Yeah. And, and they just had fried chicken yesterday. But I don't eat fried chicken, I eat big foods, you know. <laughs> okay. okay. I I hear you, I get you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's still good food nonetheless. Yeah. But 
But what is Workman Cafe, the combination of Southern and soul food? I knew there was a difference. <laughs> Southern and soul. Uh, well, you know, I guess now you're making me think. It's because I guess the best answer I can come up with is when we open, when we open, well, not back that far. Um, I think somewhere along the line, what happened was some customers started saying, every time you have the same thing every day. And they got, and I got tired of walking, watching customers walk out because they were tired of seeing the same thing every day. So I have some foods, the foods that are served every day are the items that we actually grew up eating, yes. you know. So the other foods is still considered Southern food, but I switch it up. So I, you know, some of my vegetables I switch up um, every day. But, um, yeah, yeah, they, I guess it's, they just got, I guess because the customers got tired of seeing the same thing every day. So I had to make some changes. Wow. And hey, Miss Angie, let me ask you, what dishes have you tried to create on your own while trying not to deviate from your mom's signature dishes? I've created the, um, and this, this is my accident. I started making broccoli casserole. And um, that is fair. It became so popular that I, I'm only open four days a week, but it's on the menu three, three of those days. Uh, another thing, well, the meatloaf, um, I added that. Uh, there's another dish I created, I would say about five years ago. It's called the cabbage stir fry. And um, there is no meat in it. And that's another reason why some of these dishes were created, because I started seeing an influx of customers that don't eat meat. And they didn't want meat in their vegetables. So then I created the... Um, the cabbage stir fry. And um, it's just cabbage tossed around with sweet peppers and onions and seasoned uh, with Workman's Cafe seasoning. And um, red beans and rice that my mother didn't. So the things that I, I added to the, the things I added to the menu on my own, the red beans and rice. And about two weeks ago, I made oxtails and rice. Where I took the meat, I didn't have enough oxtails to put on the menu. So I cooked the oxtails and took the meat off the bone and cooked it in the rice. So, you know, there are some things that I've tried. Um, Cajun pork chops. Wow. Yeah. So, you know. Wow, that's amazing. And yeah. <laughs> what are those other foods that you want to cook right now that you just can't put on the menu right now? I would love to serve sandwiches uh, because there's only two of us right now, but I would love to do a non-traditional, what I call non-traditional chicken sandwich. And where the chicken is served, the, the meat is on a, um, a hoagie roll instead of a hamburger bun. Uh, uh, chicken sandwich, bologna sandwich. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, shrimp sandwich, even an egg sandwich. Mm. You know, um, I created about, I would say about um, maybe 10 years ago, I created, I came up with the shrimp burger. And I I used my, I was at that time using some of my family members as guinea pigs. And so when my niece bit into it, she said, I thought you were I thought you said I was sampling a shrimp burger. I said, you are. She said, no, this is crab. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> but it's just like a crab patty. I said, it does. So, yeah, there are some things um, uh, that I would like to put on the menu. As a matter of fact, when we expand our hours to serve dinner, then uh, that means I'll have to expand my menu. And some of those items will appear in the menu. And yeah. And why dinner? Why work, Miss Cafe? Why now? Because I feel like I've, uh, why workman's? Because 
we I've gotten down the recipes. I've ironed out all of the kinks. Uh, we have a steady flow of customers who would love to be here for dinner as well. Okay. One customer said, if I served breakfast, he, he said, um, the only time my wife would see me is when it's time to go to bed. Um, because I'd be here for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And um, so dinner, I, and the reason why is because I've had some customers asking, um, have you ever considered extending your hours to serve dinner? When we first opened, we used to close at 7 o'clock. Okay. And I was serving dinner then. But after my mom passed in 01, that meal made me real, I'm sorry, not 01, 04. That made me realize that I was putting in too many hours. You know, I would be in there from six in the morning until about eight or nine o'clock at night. But um, I think now is a good time uh, because, as I've been told, I, I'm being mentored. Me, I'm, I can't speak. I'm being mentored by two chefs, two local chefs, and they both said the same thing: stick to this food because this type of food is disappearing from the low country scene. And so I want to serve, I want to stick to what I know. And so we're going to serve dinner eventually. That would be cool. I'm man. five years out. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. When you look around Charleston here, and I'm sitting here a couple of blocks away from King Street downtown, but when you look at the low country food and beverage scene right now, what exactly is missing, Ms. Angie? Um, from reading a couple of posts on, uh, I'm not sure if it was Chucktown Foodies Facebook page or Low Country Eat Out's Facebook page, hmm. but a local chef, um, s summarizing what he said, what to me was missing is loyalty among the locals, a loyalty from the locals. And um, I think what many of the locals are looking for is that wow factor. And once you, it, because but once you have blown their minds, in my opinion, once you have blown their minds, then you have to keep, you know, taking it to the next level and, to the, and then you run out of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my opinion, the one thing that I think that's missing is the loyalty among the locals, you know, because when tourist season is over with, we depend on the locals to keep us going. But um, I, I don't know. That's, that's just, you know, that's just my opinion. Whoever that, whatever that first. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and let me ask you this, Ms. Angie. How do you hope to take workman's level, well, workman's cafe to the next level without running out of ideas? Well, the next, well, first of all, well, we've been in business since two, since '01, and um, looking, I've, I've occasionally once a month, maybe once every three months, I would venture onto other restaurants' websites, look at their menus. I look at dishes online to see if that would fit Workman's Cafe's uh, menu. And sometimes I would take recipes from, you know, off online and tweak them a little bit. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I don't think, I truly believe that Workman's Cafe is a mainstay in the community. Because we offer something that's extremely hard to find. Uh, from what I've been told by some customers, is, um, and it's this type of food. Um, I, I've also been told by some customers that it's hard for them to find a decent pork chop. My customers' words, not mine. Uh, I, so, you know, so I feel like it is my obligation to keep this this menu, this platform going. Obligated to my business and obligated to the community. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. What, what are some of those new southern foods that would actually match your menu today? 
Now, I've been trying, like I, said, I mentioned, the, the Cajun pork chops, which is spicy pork chop. Something I've been working on, I can't seem to get it just right, and I'm still working on it, is serving um, hot chicken, spicy chicken. And um, that's... There, and then there are a lot of variations I have worked on with uh, with my red rice. Oh yes, and rice in general. Uh, one one day I took some red rice and made um, some shrimp fried rice with it, and one customer loved it. Uh, so from what I'm seeing online, uh, there are a few items that I did try that did not work, like the um, brought not the um, green bean casserole did not sell well. The black eyed peas did not sell well. Huh? The black eyed peas. Uh, one thing that some of my customers would love to see on my menu every day, and which I don't like, is Hoppin' John. Wait a minute, Miss Angie. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like Hoppin' John. The only time I will eat it is if I'm right there when it's done. Mm. But after it goes into the refrigerator, oh, I don't yeah. want it. Yeah. That, yeah I but um, you know, the, I tried the Hoppin' John a couple of times, and it sold very well. It served well. Um, I would love to serve soups. I don't think I, I have this one dish I would love to put out there, and I think it will only work when I start serving dinner, and that's uh, shrimp chowder. Uh, one guy asked me why not um, not shrimp shrimp bisque. And he asked me, why not she crab soup? I said, because most of the restaurants in Charleston serve she crab soup. Okay, so to sum it all up for you, Quinn, I, I want Workman's Cafe to be different. And I want a few dishes on my menu that's going to separate me from everything. I'm not looking to be the best. Right. I'm not looking to be number one. I'm just looking to be the best that I can be. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. If your mom were alive today, what particular menu item she would like and actually eat? Lima beans and rice. She ate it every day. Good Lord. The lima beans and rice. Um, even though I loved her cabbage, I loved her fried cabbage. I think she would love, I think she would like my broccoli, my cabbage uh, stir fry and my broccoli casserole. Oh. I think would love that, yeah. Wow, well, that, that that's amazing. And, and Miss Angie, with all the changes that are going on now with these different foods that are popping up around the southeast, how do you prepare and assemble soul food? First, you got to start off with passion. You really, with that type of food, you you gotta you gotta cook like grandma cooked. So in order for you to cook like grandma cooked, you got to approach it the way grandma did. You know, and, and so I cook, I don't measure anything. That's how my mom taught me how to cook. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. So you, you got to, first and foremost, you got to be passionate about the food and how you prepare the food. and. Because you want people to taste your passion. And I've had some first-timers come in and say, oh, my God, your food took me back to my grandma's table. You know, um, I've had some say, I got to bring my wife in here. You know, oh, my God, I thought my wife was a good cook. You know, so, and he, and so I've had, yeah, I, I, yeah, you got to start with the passion. It has to be passion. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What do you have a passion for to do next besides cooking? <laughs> Getting out of cooking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just started my own ministry. Oh. And um, that's when, what I'm working on right now is to staff Workman's Cafe. To hire some people to run it for me so that I can vote some time, more time to my ministry. Um, another thing I, I'm very passionate about is traveling. But 
I'm not talking about getting on an airplane type traveling. I love road trips. Yes. And before the pandemic hit, about two or three Saturdays out of every month, I took a road trip. I would go to Charlotte. I'd drive to Augusta. Yes. I've been to, to Florida. You know, so and I've been to Alabama. So it's just, I love exploring our country by way of the roads. But um, right now, after being having after doing this for almost twenty years, yeah, I'm passionate about st our staffing it and uh, freeing up my hands. Hands, wow! And, and speaking of which, Miss Angie, we're still in the middle of COVID, obviously. But how did you ad adjust to that in the beginning for your restaurant? In the beginning, we let's see, in twenty twenty. This, everything went into quarantine and went and shut down March of 2020. And in April, about a month later, I shut down for two months. No, I'm going anyway, I shut down for two months in spring, in the spring of 2020. And then I came back and things slowly picked up. When I came back, everything was strictly carry out. Right. And, uh, of course, some of my customers didn't like that. And when I told them I had no choice. So everything was strictly carry out. And then I went went into, I brought the tape, some of the tables and chairs back in, um, six feet apart. And then when I saw where customers were leaving because there was no place to sit, well, it was right at that, about a few days after that was when, the governor said, okay, we're just going to open everything back up. And so I brought in the rest of the tables and chairs. But um, it wasn't as hard for me as I thought it would have been. And, uh, of course, I had to juggle some things around with no income uh, for those two months. But that also allowed me to get some work done uh, on the inside and the outside. Wow. Wow. Well, thank God you're back open and doing well, as always. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. you. You're very welcome. Chef Angie Bellinger uh, with Workers' Cafe, thank you for your time. And again, welcome to the award-winning Quentin's School Sucks. Thank you so much, sir. I'm, I appreciate you having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime. <laughs>